The EOQ can be extended many different ways, okay? And we're going to talk about three extensions um, in this class. The, the, the issue with EOQ is, comes back to, what, we, what did we talk about a few slides back? Demand is known and constant. You violate that, you shouldn't be using EOQ, which means a lot of times you probably shouldn't be using EOQ. Uh, but in those instances where it is true, um, you want to use EOQ. Now, we're going to work quite a few EOQ problems to get you thinking about inventory. Um, we'll work some in class. Um, you'll work some in the homework. So let's extend EOQ a little bit. The previous EOQ model assumed that the entire inventory was received at one time. Uh, there are times where we may continuously receive inventory, such as a machine building up items internally. And this requires another item, a model called the finite production EOQ or POQ. And so let's draw this out. We have a production rate P, okay, and a demand rate lambda. So we have P, which is production rate. And typically items per year. And then lambda, demand items per year. Now, what has to be true for this problem to work out nicely? Which one's bigger, the production rate or the demand? The demand rate. Production rate. The production rate. If, if the demand's greater than the production rate, what's your inventory position going to go to? Zero. Go, go down, below the, it'll go to negative infinity, right? Because you'll never be able to make the demand, and that's, that's one of the assumptions. So this is time, and then this is, this is the inventory position. It's how much inventory we have. So let's assume we start at zero at time zero. We're producing faster than the demand, so we're going to go up at a slope. And then at some point, we're going to get enough inventory, and then what do we do? We go down. And we make a triangle like this. But they'll all be the same. Okay, I can't draw. So we go up at a rate of P minus lambda. We go down at lambda. Now this is a very different triangle than before. Because remember before, it was a right angle down, right angle down. So you're holding less inventory. Okay? And let's say the production rate and the demand were very similar. Let's say our production rate was 50 units per year and our demand was 49. Even if we continuously ran, how many units would we have at the end of the year? One. So there would be never a need to shut off the process, right? We would slowly build and then we would shut it off and then we would pay a setup cost to turn it back on. So the, 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 the more gradual this is, the less inventory you hold. Because remember, if, if this was instantaneous, we would be all the way up here. And so we're cutting off all this inventory. So as a result, our equation of Q over 2 no longer works. And what we have to do is modify that equation. And so we, 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 can, we can say that each cycle we produce Q items. And so we can take... Um, we, what we need to do is modify our holding cost to account for this. And you can show that the holding cost, the new holding cost, is Q1 minus lambda P. And so to, to do this, we have an order cost of K lambda over Q. Our holding cost now is HQ1 minus lambda P over 2. Or as the, the book likes to put it, H prime which is you just adjust your holding cost as holding cost 1 minus lambda over P. And remember, if, if they're almost the same, holding cost basically disappears. And so now you can compute a new Q star, which is 2K lambda over H, where H now is H prime, which is H 
1 minus lambda p. So let's do a quick example. Let's assume that we have 2,500 units of demand, a production rate of 10,000, a setup cost of $50, a 30% interest rate, a cost of the part of $2. And so what we would do is we'd compute H prime. So it's $2 part, 30% interest rate, so it's $6 per unit year to keep that part on hand. And then we adjust that based on the fact that, that we're, we're not going always on hand, but we're, we're gradually going up and down. And we find 45, per, 45 uh, cents per, per year. We plug that in. 2 times lambda, 2,500 units per year demand, times setup of 50 divided by 0.45. And we come up with 745 units is our, our Q. Now, how many times do we start this production process, or what's the time between starting it? Well, we, we, we're, we're producing 745 units at a time. We use 2,500 units per year. So um, basically 0 .0 0 0.3 of a year, we're running the machine, and then we turn it off, for, or, or that's our cycle time. So the number of runs per year would be 3.35, and the uptime in each cycle would be um, our 745 units divided by our production rate, which is 10,000. So the machine's on for 0 .7, 0 0.07 of a year, and then it would be off for 0.21 of a year, and then on for 0.7 of a year, and off for 0.21. Everybody kind of follow? Okay. Now, the next extension, and I, I, I'm unlikely to give this on a test, would be an all units discount. So maybe our supplier says, I don't want to deal in small orders. So if you order one box, I'm going to charge you $50. If you order 10 boxes, I'm going to charge you $48. And if you order 100 boxes, I'm going to charge you $46. It's not a good idea, by the way, and we'll get to why later in the course. But they do exist, right? You do sometimes offer quantity discounts. And so typically they're on all units, or they could be incremental to the, the, the additional unit ordered. If you have an all unit discount, what you would do is you would compute the EOQ for each value and then determine it at the largest realized value. So you would compute the EOQ given that you order less than 10, and if it turns out to be 10, you, you'd evaluate it at 10, and then EOQ for the next range, and the next range. And you would compare the annual cost of the largest realized EOQ at, at, within all the ranges, okay? And that, then you would find the minimum one. Or an alternative approach, find the EOQ for all unit discounts, compute the annual cost within each discount range, and then pick, pick, pick the, the, the lowest annual cost. Um, incremental discounts is a lot harder. You gotta come up with an algebraic expression for C of Q, and, you subs and, and then you, then you um, basically solve for the minimum point based on that algebraic expression. Now, many other discount structures exist, and, and a good one is truckload. And I want to talk about this for a second. Transportation costs vary a lot, right? If you ship one package, it might be $25. If you ship that package in a truck with a whole bunch of other packages exactly the same, it might be 3 or $4, okay? And what happens with transportation, and let's assume that it just weighs out the truck, okay? And let's also assume that a truck in this state can hold 45,000 pounds, which is, eh, it depends on what road it's going on and a bunch of other factors, but it's, it's a good guideline, okay? Um, now, if you ship one pound of material, how do you ship it? Who am I going to call to ship one pound? UPS. UPS. It's parcel, right? And to ship a parcel at UPS, probably three or four dollars, right? Um, now, if you get up to 50 pounds, or you're still calling UPS, 170 pounds, who do you call? 
right? UPS. Uh, well, today you might just call UPS because they do have an LTL carrier. They do a less than truckload. You do a less than truckload. And, and you call UPS, yeah, they'll take it, but it's not, it's not going to go in the little brown truck. Um, because why? They have a, about a 150-pound weight limit, and then, you know, it goes into their other network, which is the less-than-truckload. And what does a less-than-truckload carrier do? It takes the stuff, pulls it together, and sends it to a hub, and then it goes to another hub and gets to you, okay? Designed for about 200 pounds <laughs> to maybe 10,000 pounds. And once you get over 10,000 pounds, what would you do? 10 or 20,000 pounds. You got 40,000 pounds of stuff out there. Who do I call? Freight company. Somebody with a truck, right? Call a, call a freight company and, and they'll send a truck. And, and, and it's your truck. Are they going to mix your freight with anybody else? No. They're just going to come pick up your freight, drop it off where you, where you want to drop it off. They'll, they'll charge you per mile. And if you look at the price per pound... Or nah, let's not look at the price per pound. Let's look at the total cost. This is fairly cheap. And then this increase is basically linear. And then you get to 10,000 pounds and something magical happens. It's constant. Right? Does that truck driver care if he's carrying 10,000 pounds for you or 45,000 pounds? Not much. Especially if you're... You know, there, there are milk runs and some other things that you might be able to do. But basically, in transportation, what you will find is structure, cost structures like this. So, when you're setting inventory policy, you may have complex cost structures. And, and you want to you wanna look and find... Um, the, the, the best cost, so your cost per item changes as your order quantity does, okay? So you'd have to come up with an algebraic expression, figure that out, or just use some common sense. And, and usually common sense is, is, is the order of the day. Now, one extension, and this is not an ideal test question, this won't be on the test, is let's consider you have a space constraint. So we only have so much space to put stuff and we have different weights for per items, and they have to be less than our total space. And what you can do is you can, see, not on the test, you can set up what, what they call a Lagrange multiplier and solve this. And this is mostly for the benefit of our graduate students. Um, basically, you can add a constraint and solve an optimization problem and adjust the order quantities based on the weight. Now, some closing remarks on EOQ. Um, the whole just-in-time movement focused on getting rid of work in process and other inventories. And the EOQ results from a truly traditional way of thinking about inventory and scale of economics of production. And proponents argue that it's essential and just-in-time to reduce setup cost. So we're going to do everything possible to reduce setup cost under, under EOQ, or just in time. What happens under our EOQ when setup costs go low? Setup cost goes to zero. What does the order quantity go to? If I plug in the zero there, what's Q going to be? Zero. zero. So as a result... The just-in-time philosophy and EOQ are not that dissimilar. But what's the problem? People who, who are proponents of the just-in-time philosophy never get beyond eliminating inventory, right? The part of being able to eliminate inventory is what? Eliminating setup cost in all their forms. And there are some setup costs that you can't eliminate, such as the difference in transportation cost from shipping one part instead of one pallet. Um, some believe there's substantial value in the just-in-time approach that can be easily that cannot be easily incorporated into a math model. So, what is the true value of holding cost? Is hard to determine. People have historically underestimated it. How does holding cost impact quality? Also, hard to determine it. 
because inventory hides problems. Um, quality problems can be identified and rectified before uh, our inventories of defective parts accumulate if you have less inventory, obviously. Um, hard to locate quality problems in large inventory. Um, plants can be more flexible if they're not burdened with excess in-process inventory. Space is expensive on the factory floor. Capital is expensive. Don't underestimate inventory cost. Talked about transportation and packaging. Um, <coughs> transportation considerations tend to increase inventories. Transportation tends to shift the focus to periodic reordering. The supplier has multiple parts. Um, and we'll talk at length about transportation. Important, obviously, to ship in full pallets or level layers. And these considerations are as important as setting the, the value of Q. I'm going to say this one last time. One of my favorite test questions is to give you the number of parts on a pallet. Okay? So a pallet can hold, oh gosh, that's an ugly pallet. Let's say six boxes. EOQ tells you to do two boxes. Is that the right answer? Well, what's going to happen? And, and Sorry, I can't draw. I have a pallet with six boxes on it, right? It's designed, the containers are designed to look like this. So if you have two pallets on it, how much cardboard do you have compared to when you have six? Well, you would have, I guess, a third, right? Not only that, it's worse than that is that these are not touching each other. Cardboard likes to touch each other. Okay? Car have, have, have any of you seen um, a pallet that's totally packed with boxes appropriately? You can stand on it, even if it's real flimsy cardboard. And you can stack pallets on top of pallets, as long as they're level layers, um, typically. Now, not always true, obviously, right? Somebody could use really flimsy cardboard, but they don't. They typically, you have what they call a packaging engineer, right? And his job is to figure out what? The forces involved and how thick the cardboard has to be, etc. But what is he designed for? Full pallets. You take out the support and you're in trouble. Um, for instance... For instance, um, even if I just remove one of these things, I'm going to have two weak points here and here where the thing could get crushed, okay? So I guess, I guess the takeaway is on the test, make sure that if I give you pallets, to give your answer in terms of pallets. Make sense? So 5.2 pallets, not good. Either do five or six. Um... So what you have to do is you have to read Chapter 4. I'm going to post some EOQ problems on Blackboard. We'll discuss them next time. Uh, the test, first test, is 40% problems, 60% functional and reading. Issues some of the online students have been having. Um, I've posted a homework assignment called a technical interview. And what you want to do is read through those job descriptions, find one that you like, and then answer some questions that are in the assignment, or give me a call if you want to do a mock interview with me. That is to be done at the end of the course, after you've learned the material. Doing it now, uh, you know, if you've done it already, you know, you did it before you learned the course, and, you know, you can submit it, and I'll grade it, and I'm not going to take off points, but, um, you know, hopefully at the end of the course you can do it better than your, your first one, right? Um, also, the SAP assignment is posted. Um, you can start looking at it, um, downloading it, looking at it. We'll have some formal time next time to go through it. Um, but neither of those assignments, is there any rush because you have the whole semester. Uh, graduate students, I'd suggest knocking off the SAP assignment pretty early, also undergraduates, but you know, no need to rush on either of them. Uh, any questions about the course before um, we end the recording? Yes. Um, 
Maybe there's paper reviews online. Do we? That's the third big assignment. Paper reviews. Download the papers. We we discussed that earlier. Write one page about each paper. Answer those questions. Uh, it'll prepare you for the test. About three or four questions on each test come directly from the papers. So if you've actually read them, uh, you'll be in good shape. And you can do those now. So if, if you're bored this weekend, paper reviews. Okay, and they're great papers. The, I mean, they're, 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 they're interesting reading. At least for me, they are. I guess that's a, that's, that's, that's a per, personal question if you like them. But the, they really are easy to read given the topics they're discussing. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Similarly, like for SAP also we need to read a few papers. Graduate students do. Um, graduate students spend some time on your SAP projects describing the difference between SAP terminology and the terminology in this class and read a few papers on SAP would be good to include in your projects. Undergraduates, you guys just have to um, read the material that's already posted in Blackboard as part of your SAP assignment, okay? And yes? When is the first test going to be? I don't see a specific date on the syllabus. Or I'm missing that. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't think there's a specific date. But we can figure that out. That's going to be in class, right? Not online. Graduate students are in class. Undergraduates are online. Um, the first test will not be for a while. We have... Assuming everything goes perfectly, which it never does, we have um, we have where we just finished EOQ lecture four. Um, we do news vendor and stochastic inventory, and then we do a practical inventory. And then we do um, four lectures additional. So we are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lectures away from the first test. Yes. Seven or eight. So I would anticipate the first test. First week of October. First week of October, yeah. Do you typically do those during a, a certain window online? For yes. Uh, undergraduates, the window, that's a good question, will probably um, be either Friday night, Saturday night, or Thursday night, depending on how many objections I get. So, so it's just one evening? That one evening. Or well, we could do two if necessary. Um, and typically it's eight to ten. Okay? Graduate students, you get to come in here and take your exam, okay? Um, works out better. Any other questions? And the exams in Blackboard, um, I don't like giving speed tests, but you do have to be fairly quick on it. Um, it's, it, it. The other thing is that there'll be four or five essay questions or working out the problems and those of you who have never had my tests before, they are very difficult and they are curved a lot. So your score really doesn't matter other than how it relates to the people around you. So, you know, 70% could be a high A. You know, if everybody did good, I guess it could be 70%. Um, but, you know, it's, it, I use the full grade range. So when you're taking the test, don't get scared. You may think you're doing very badly. You may be top in the class. So does it, does everybody kind of understand that grading policy? Yeah, will the essay portions also be part of the timed 
Yes, window. but they're, they're, they're short essay. I mean, they're, they're, they're less than a paragraph. Okay. And they're really working problems. Um, so it, it's, um, you know, time shouldn't be a huge constraint. Any other questions? Now, the final for undergraduates, we're going to have to work, work, work out because that, that will in some way be proctored. Uh, first test won't be. Okay. If there are no further questions, uh, have a great weekend and, and uh, read the paper reviews if you're bored.